Okay, so it's recording. So anyone have any um, success stories to share about increasing their fruit and vegetable intake this week or new recipes that they've tried they really liked or some new seasoning or sauce they made? Anyone have anything to share? I will sh share my little success story. So um, on Sunday, I made a super yummy Thai bowl. I used a little bit of quinoa and then chopped up some cabbages and pepper and carrot. And then I made a little peanut sauce, which was super quick and easy. And I had some toasted cashews with it. So it was super yummy and really co colorful. So that was my success. Um, Marianne just shared she hosted Thanksgiving dinner. Wow, way to be ahead of the game. Um, she made a broccoli cauliflower salad. So way to add in some veggies there. And sweet potatoes and mashed potatoes and green peas and relish tray. All right. Okay, if you guys want to share success stories that come to you later, we can go with that. I'm going to go through and uh, start this. So um, this week we had on the schedule um, habits, but we wanted to do a little recap of the kidney, low protein, plant-based diet, just to kind of review a few things, maybe fill in a few holes. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific with the keto analogs, but we'll make sure you get that information. Thanks. So, um, so the first thing I just wanted to review, what do our kidneys do? They do a lot of awesome things for us. So they help with um, red blood cell production so that our cells can get all the oxygen that they need. They help to regulate a lot of different types of hormones. They help keep our bones healthy. They get, uh, they get rid of waste. They help balance our fluids and minerals and electrolytes. And they help to control blood pressure. Um, to be honest, kidneys do a lot of different things, but these are some good basics um, to know of what our kidneys do for us. Um, there are a lot of things that can contribute to kidney damage. And one of the reasons why the kidneys are susceptible to damage is because there's always a lot of blood moving through the kidneys. I mean, it has to filter everything and that doesn't always have the best defense systems. And so they can be really um, susceptible to different things. So the main contributors to kidney disease are diabetes and high blood pressure. Those two things alone contribute to 70% of um, kidney disease, especially people who end up with kidney failure, just those two things. Um, but family history can also be part of it, smoking, diet, obesity, um, just getting older, and then your race can sometimes uh, play a role. And also, if you have some kind of um, injury or um, you're born with one kidney, those kind of things can impact um, kidney disease. And so diet really matters because look back, how many of these things are preventable? The first two, not entirely preventable, but there's a big part of it that's preventable. You can't do anything about your family history, but smoking and diet, those things can play a big role. And so you guys clearly already get the memo that diet really helps, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So there are five specific things to mention of contributors to kidney damage, and that is high protein intake, high salt intake, high phosphorus intake, not enough fruits and vegetables, and a high acid load or low bicarbonate levels, which the bicarbonate would show up in uh, your labs that you get done. So these are things that as um, we've been planning out these classes, we've been trying to address all of these issues as we go through the class to help make sure that we help as much as possible on the diet end. So, to give a little bit better picture um, of animal protein. So here we've got some beef and then you eat it and your body breaks it down and you get some good things from it, obviously different vitamins and minerals, 
but when your body ends up breaking it down, there's nitrogen and phosphorus that is left over that your kidney has to filter out. So that's where we always have this balance of trying to um, make sure that you get enough protein to meet your needs, but not so much that it creates extra work for the kidney. The other thing that we're just learning about with animal protein is that not only um, does it create extra work for the kidney filtering out the nitrogen and phosphorus, but that there's different types of bacteria in your intestines and the not so friendly type of bacteria feeds off of animal protein. And so if you have an imbalance of bacteria down there and you eat a really high protein diet, then you are going to have a lot of toxins from that unfriendly bacteria that has to be filtered out by the kidney. But um, it also doesn't all get all filtered out by the kidney. It goes around all over to your body and can cause inflammation and damage. And so that's another reason why we want to keep that uh, balanced. And so the other thing that animal protein does is that it causes a higher level of acid production and the kidneys as we just saw earlier they have to help balance that acid and base in our bloodstream otherwise certain types of reactions can't happen um, and that would cause a lot of systems in your body to malfunction and so if we can take less burden off your kidneys because they don't have to filter out the waste the toxins from bacteria and they don't have to try and correct that acid then that means that they're going to last longer. Hey there, quick question. This is James. Yeah. Um, I think the wrong screen of yours is being shared. We're seeing your Gmail screen. Oh my gosh. And it sounds like you're walking through some slides. <laughs> there we go. I see a cow now. Oh my gosh. Okay. Let's go back and see these screens better. Okay. So this is a summary of the past three screens that I showed. So, um, thank you, for James, for telling me that. Um, so we have the animal protein contributing to um, more, throughout, more uh, feeding of the bad bacteria that create more waste to filter out and more inflammation. And then you've got to try and filter out this acid um, or maintain that acid-base balance. So that's why we really try with um, the diet changes we're making to alleviate that burden on the kidneys. Um, because otherwise, your kidneys end up like this sad little guy, which we are trying to avoid. So how does a low protein plant-based diet help? So it decreases the workload for the kidneys because of the decreased protein, less nitrogen and phosphorus has to be filtered out, less acid load. It decreases protein that's lost in the urine. And this is especially true for diabetics. Diabetics tend to have significantly higher loss of protein in the urine. And so if we can decrease that, then that helps uh, preserve your kidney function too. And then it decreases the production of toxins and inflammation altogether because that bacteria isn't being fed. Um, so it helps in a lot of ways. And I'm sure that down the road, we're going to see how it helps in other ways that we don't understand yet. So this diet is more likely to be successful in slowing the disease progression if you have to eat enough calories from other sources, so carbohydrates and fats. A lot of the concern why some people, some healthcare providers, they don't recommend the very low protein diet is because studies have been done to show that people get really malnourished if they eat a very low protein diet. But that's when they didn't have enough calories in general. People that eat enough calories from healthy fats and carbs, they did really well and saw good benefits. So that's the key. And so that's why, like on the snacks list and things Jess is always talking about, like making sure to get some of those extra snacks in to make sure you've got enough of those calories. You also need to make sure that you're choosing anti-inflammatory foods. So fruits, vegetables, and healthy fats. Um, not only does this not feed that not so friendly bacteria, but it also feeds 
the friendly bacteria in your gut and it creates a beneficial environment for that friendly bacteria to grow and flourish. And that in turn helps out all aspects of your body because the fruits and the vegetables and healthy fats, they're better digested. You get more nutrients from them. Lots of good benefits from that. Feed your friendly gut bacteria. And then using the keto analogs when you follow a very low protein diet. And that's where talking with Jess, who's having a chance to talk with you about your individual goals and reviewing your food logs, she can talk with you more about how that will specifically help you reach your goals of improving your kidney function. The other key is to make sure that you're consistent for at least 90 days um, before you try and um, be a little more liberal or kind of cheat on the diet. Um, because this way you're able to get a baseline. So you know that when you're consistently eating a low protein plant-based diet, this is how my body feels. This is how my kidneys function. This is what my numbers look like. If you can do that for 90 days. If you are not consistent, it's really hard to tell what changes in your diet are causing uh, different changes in your blood work or how you're feeling. So you have to be consistent for that first 90 days so that you can get a feel and your body can get a feel for what this is doing. And then after that, in talking with your doctor or Jessiana, you can make some adjustments. Then you'll be able to clearly see like, oh, if I add this in, do I feel different? Does that change my kidney labs? Is this going to help me still reach my goals? And if not, then, then you know what you need to change back to. But if you're inconsistent, it's really hard to know what's causing what. And the other thing you have to realize is that they're guidelines. You're an individual and should work with your doctor and dietitian to personalize what your body needs. And so a lot of this class, we're trying to personalize it as much as we can, um, but it's only, you know, so many weeks. And so you're going to continue to need some kind of follow-up to continue to personalize it so that you can get the best results. We're trying to give you a lot of foundational tools to help you be successful, but you're going to continue to need follow-up. So just remember, you can change your diet, even though it's not easy. Um, and so that's why we're going to talk about habits a little bit today, because habits is what can make things easier. So here's a great quote from an Olympic athlete. I don't really actually don't know. I should have asked Clarissa. She put this picture in. Motivation is what gets you started. Habit is what keeps you going. So any questions about the science of that at all? Did that, was that a helpful review? Okay, so on to habits. So I think that we've all heard that um, it takes 60 days to make a habit or 21 days to make a habit. And um, we, Jess and me and um, Shay, we've been looking at some different things and, and we think that we can make it easier if we are smarter about how we make habits. So. Making habits really isn't as hard as you think. And so we've got some pictures here of things that most of us might do every day, like how and when we brush our teeth, how you wash your hair, like we have a specific routine, um, how you get ready for work, the way that you feed your pets. There's lots of things that we do. We have tons and tons of habits, habits that we didn't even intend to make, right? And so while we might have to be more intentional about some habits and uh, be more intentional about some habits more than others, we don't um, have to make it as hard as we think it is. So this is, these are just some uh, ideas to help you and we've got a worksheet uploaded so you can kind of think through what we've talked about today and you can choose a couple of uh, one or two things that you want to work on. So the first um, step in forming successful habits is to start with small, really specific actions. So this is just an example. So let's say that you want to exercise more. Um, if you are thinking in your head, okay, I am going to try walking to get more exercise. 
Okay, so that seems kind of specific, right? But what if you said, I'm going to walk every day after work. I'll change into my walking shoes as soon as I get home. That kind of spells it out for you of how you're going to accomplish your goal. And it's a fairly small thing. And so that's kind of the first step is be specific about it. And sometimes you might have to kind of think through some barriers of how to think about it. Like if you um, don't work every day and you wanted to exercise every day, then walking every day after work may not be specific enough for you. So you just need to think through specifically of how you're going to accomplish that goal. And one way to see if it's specific enough for you is to kind of picture yourself going through and doing whatever that goal is. So um, for exercising more, you couldn't just, if you said, okay, I'm exercising more, that leaves a lot of white space in your brain, right? But if you're like, I'm gonna get home, change into my walking shoes after work, and I'm gonna go on a walk, then that clearly has your whole thing imagined out. So you can kind of see how you're actually accomplishing that goal. So that's how you know if it's specific enough. So can any of you share, and I'll unmute some lines here, what is a small specific thing that you can do or that you have done since starting this class to have a low protein plant-based breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or snack? So let me unmute you guys. Okay. Anyone have any thoughts they want to share? Well, some very simple ones that I'm sure everybody already does, and that's always have a, a meal ready in the refrigerator that you can pop from the refrigerator into the microwave. And you'd be surprised how often you'd use it. Yes, that is a really great idea. So how did you make that goal? Do you just like make an extra portion from a meal so that you have that ready to go? Well, I'm a I'm a cook and, and cook and freeze person, so I always have it either in the freezer or in the refrigerator. But I think if if you leave it that way, so you know, instead of making one serving of something, make eight, eat a couple, and freeze the rest, and then in a very short period of time, you have a lot of things on hand. Yes, perfect. That's a really great example. Thanks for sharing that. Anyone else have any small specific? actions or like one that you're thinking you want to do? Okay, so we have the worksheet so that you can kind of think through it. Um, that's kind of a, a little homework assignment um, for you this week is to work through that worksheet so you can see, okay, how am I doing, you know, what kind of additional goals do I need? So this just gives some other ideas. So we've already got that one great idea of always have an extra meal prepared because you've prepared extra leftovers that you keep in the fridge or in the freezer. Another one is plan out three low protein breakfasts for this week. That's kind of a thing that I do when I'm trying to make changes is that if I have to think about it, it's really hard. But if I come home from work and I already know what I'm doing, then it's super easy for me to do. Or if I'm getting up, I need to know, oh, do I have to plan out a breakfast? No, I already thought about the day before or whatever. So that's one thing you can do. Um, you can just make sure that you have the supplies on hand that you need to use for meals that you're gonna make during the week or go grocery shopping for new produce or new items on the weekend to use this week. That's half the battle is making sure you got that stuff on hand, right? So the next step is to make it easy to do. So going back to our analogy of exercising more, so you might want to put your shoes next to the door, but you'll see them and you can easily find them because how many times do you think, oh, I want to do this thing, but then you can't find it or you're kind of in a hurry. So make it easy for you to do. So um, that's part of that simple specific thing. It kind of helps you think through the steps that you need to do to make it easy for you. And so as far as making changes with your diet, um, what kind of things have you guys done to make it easier for you to do? Um, 
or if you could do something different, what would make it easier for you to do? Oops. I think planning is a really key thing for me. Um, if I can plan things out ahead of time, that makes it easier for me because I've already thought through it. I feel like for me, half the time is just trying to figure it out. And if I've already thought through it, then it's easy to do. So when you're thinking about your goals and the specific thing you're going to do, think about what makes it hard for me to do. Why don't I do it already? Oh, Marianne popped in on the chat and said she makes the menu for the week. So again, preparation, super key. And then, yep, and then Marianne said, uh, then I know what I need groceries wise and what, you know, meat she's feeding her husband so that she can make it easier for both of them. So, perfect. Preparation is half the battle. Okay, oh, so here's some pictures showing like pre-chopping vegetables up. Um, you can put the salad in the jar kind of idea. So that's kind of the same idea as the pre-made meal. Um, so whatever makes it easier for you, just try and find one or two things that can help. The other thing that helps to make something a habit is actual physical movement. So the exercise one is pretty easy because to do it, you have to change to your workout clothes or put on your shoes um, instead of going and sitting on the couch without the intention of exercising. So like, let's say, again, back to the exercising idea, you come home from work and the phone is ringing, so you don't put on your shoes right away. But while you're on the phone, you can change into your shoes and then you can be on your way once you're done with that. And so um, that's kind of the same idea, like if you pre-chopped up your vegetables already, that is a physical thing that you have done to prepare yourself for that uh, new goal. So for us, um, kind of like Marianne's idea of making out the menu, that is a physical thing that you're actually doing. So if you have a certain day of the week or a certain time where you just sit down and kind of think, all right, what am I gonna be eating? That's gonna make it a lot easier for you to stick with that habit. Um, so, looking up new recipes to try, pinning things on your fridge, doing an inventory of your pantry. Um, anyone want to share ideas? It's kind of hard to separate the physical movements from uh, making it easy. Sometimes they're one and the same. Okay. Okay, and then using auditory or visual cues. And again, a lot of these things kind of overlap. So this is how they kind of theorize that habits are formed. So you come home from work, you see the couch, and you sit down and watch TV. And then that kind of becomes a habit because every time you see that couch and you're like, oh yeah, I am so tired. I worked all day, I totally want to sit down. So what you have to do is kind of change your auditory and visual cues if you want to do something different. So, um, Okay, so if you want to start exercising after work, putting your shoes by the door helps because not only are you making it easier for yourself, but you're going to see those shoes, so you're going to remember to do it. So you do it, put on the shoes, and then you go for the run. And so that's kind of, if you're changing your diet and you come home from uh, work and you're hungry and normally you'd, I don't know, grab some chicken nuggets out of the fr freezer to pop in the oven. Okay, so now you come home from work and you open up the fridge or the freezer, you see all your pre-made meals, it'll be really easier for you to make that change. So that's kind of the, the cue. It doesn't always have to be something like that. It can be a reminder on your phone. It can be a picture on your phone. And sometimes the auditory or visual cues, they don't have to remind you what to do. Sometimes it needs to remind you why you're doing it. 
someone myself, I've had to make some pretty significant changes with my diet. And I know that sometimes it can be really frustrating because not everyone else is doing it and they seem fine. So why do I have to make these changes? So you have to remind yourself, why am I going to all the effort to make these diet changes? Um, and so if that's a picture of you um, traveling or playing with grandkids or doing some sort of physical activity that you like to do and you want to be able to keep doing that so you're making these healthy changes, whatever it is that can kind of help you stay motivated and remind you what or why you're trying to do, that will be a helpful thing. So these are just kind of some examples of you have the food on hand, so then it's easy for you to make that dish that you had planned, and then you've got that habit of making those lower protein plant-based uh, choices. Anyone have any thoughts to share on any of this? Any of you guys have some different visual cues you've been using to kind of help you make these changes? Okay, I know sometimes it's kind of hard to think on the spot. So this is what we made that worksheet for. So kind of help you out so that you can kind of think through these things. So this just gives some ideas of some different audio visual cues. So this one's kind of more like a why you're doing it. Um, and you know, you've got reminders or things on your phone. You've got recipes you can put on the fridge or wherever you uh, do your meal prep. So any questions about forming habits? Anyone have any like struggles, like barriers that they haven't really been able to work with that they want to overcome? All right, so that is what we have for class today. Um, we are uploading some bonus content because of the time of year it is to help with um, navigating the holidays and trying to stick with your health goals. And so um, we'll get that uploaded for you and um, definitely let us know if you have questions or concerns about how to navigate it. Or, you know, um, Marianne said she had a great Thanksgiving dinner and was able to really enjoy it with all of her different uh, vegetables. So it can definitely be done. Um, so that is what we've got for today. Like I said, let us, let us know any questions or concerns and we will see you guys next week. I have a question. Uh, yes. It's nothing about the habits, but I haven't heard anything said much throughout this class about drinking adequate amount of fluid. And I've always been told by my doctor to keep the kidneys wet. Because sometimes if you don't drink enough fluid dehydration, that can affect your lab data as well. Oh, yeah, that is a really good question. Um, that one, like speaking generally to people, that one can be kind of tricky in kidney disease because people have different levels of kidney function and some True. people on the lower end of the spectrum, they might need to restrict their fluid a little bit. Um, and so to be honest, your, your doctor is the one who is most specifically going to be seeing you, seeing if you have like some edema, some swelling going on from extra fluid, or if you maybe you are dehydrated. Um, so, cause some people are taking diuretics, you know, medications that help your kidneys get rid of more fluid. Some people um, definitely need more or less. So that's a really good question. Um, you definitely want to make sure that you're drinking enough. A general rule of thumb, they say for people with kidney disease, is if your doctor has mentioned a fluid restriction, usually if you can keep track of the amount of urine you make in a whole day and maybe do it for a couple of days, because that will vary based on how much you drink it and how much sodium you have. Um, once you can kind of get that average, you have the total amount of urine you make in a day plus about four cups, then that should give you enough fluid to keep you hydrated, but not um, too much that causes extra strain on your kidneys. But
But if you have a high enough level of kidney function and your doctor hasn't mentioned any fluid restriction or you ask them, he's like, no, you don't have a fluid restriction, then you can kind of start with that eight cups a day and adjust depending on how you feel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any questions before we end today? All righty. Well, thanks you guys. I'm glad that you've had some success stories and definitely keep sharing them with us here in class or on the Facebook page. And we'll see you next week. Hi, everyone. See you later. <laughs>